I'm going to start with what I start every day with, which is talking about the threat. And, and you've seen and read a lot about it. Uh, we used to have a hard time talking about it because uh, there wasn't a lot of information I could use in an unclassified environment. Uh, so when the Missile Defense Review came out, uh, they had a lot of the, the graphics that you see uh, here on this slide. And what I like about it, it, it kind of helps you understand, you know, when people talk about uh, short range, medium range, long range, which is kind of in our wheelhouse from a ballistic missile defense perspective, intercontinental ballistic uh, missile range. And to kind of you know, put it in perspective for you, the range from uh, a rogue nation in the Pacific uh, to Hawaii, that's an ICBM range. Uh, the range from that same uh, uh, Indo-PACOM threat uh, down to Guam is an intermediate range. And so it starts to make sense if you understand the capabilities of the system, why we have that in certain places, why we put ships in other places, and why we have ground-based missile defenses uh, you know, to protect the, uh, uh, the upper 49th. Um, so it's a pretty uh, heavy area just looking at ballistic missile defense. If you look at some of the launches that were done back in 17 and go re read what's in the white world on some of those, it was a challenging time because we knew they were definitely kind of pushing to figure out where there might be uh, some opportunities within our defensive uh, umbrellas. And uh, so that, that uh, continues to be a, a pretty uh, interesting area, ballistic missile defense. And then you have the hypersonic uh, side of the house, and the speeds are kind of down on the lower right hand of the side, just to give you a sense. Uh, you know, most people talk in terms of miles per hour, so I kind of use those, but it's, it's typically defined uh, you know, in terms of speed of sound, and so we'll, you know, we'll look at the Mach numbers. Uh, but that's just fast, right? It doesn't matter what the numbers are. If you're, if you're uh, you know, in a bunker or you're on a ship, you're someplace else, when it comes in at you low and fast and maneuvering, you know, nobody wants to have that kind of day. And so, so our job is to figure out how we stop that kind of threat from coming in. You know, we're not really a first strike country, so our first line of defense has to be a no-fail mission, and we got to get it right the first time. And that, that's just a tough place to be. You got to be alert. You have to have exquisite indications and warning. You have to have the ability to get to track, to get to fire control, and get the weapons off on time. Whether you're defending in a, against a ballistic missile or a hypersonic or a cruise missile, which can look like any of that, right? So, so it's a tough area, and it's uh, continuing to increase, and, and we know that. And so we're investing in a lot of areas so that we can counter these threats. Some of them, most of them, the tough ones we can do today. Some of the things that are evolving in the future, we've got investment paths to get us there, and I'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so next chart, please, Greg. So I want to give you a little bit about the PB21 budget themes. There's been a lot of that in the news. You know, we did the budget rollout at the department level. Uh, I think you've kind of, you're familiar with most of this, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but when we talk about alignment to the national defense strategy, you know, and, and making this a irreversible implementation, um, you know, you can kind of define that the way you want. Uh, but in my view, it's about making sure that we go do all the things we said we would go do which means that there's got to be some reprioritization in some of our budgets. You're seeing that uh, in the Army, uh, certainly within the Navy and in the Air Force, and it's no different for the Missile Defense Agency. We, we did a lot of reprioritization at the department level uh, to get us down the path where we're going. I'll talk more about that in just a bit. Um, when you get into uh, what our priorities are and what our mission space is, uh, we're in direct support of the services, the Army being one of them, and, uh, and I'll talk more about that in just a bit. Um, but you know that's all about giving flexibility to the combatant commands, what we deliver, what we develop, and in a lot of cases, you know, side by side uh, with the services to make sure that those capabilities are there when we need them and that you have as much flexibility as possible. At the end of the day, it comes down to readiness. Are we ready to go right now? Are we ready to go tonight? And so, so that's, a, that's a huge focus area. Uh, and then when you move down to building out force structure, uh, delivering more capability, that, that's kind of another line of effort. And then, then you get down to, to dealing with those, uh, those rising threats. And so that's kind of the top part of the chart. When you get down to the bottom of this chart, it kind of gets into you know, what we really see in terms of how we've been shaped uh, in terms of budget for, you know, let's just look at 21 and out. You know, for us, it's the next generation interceptor, interceptor that's uh, defending the homeland uh, against uh, ballistic missiles. And that, that's, that's going to be a high-end development. That's an all round development. It's not just a warhead development. This is the full-up round, which is, you know, in itself a, a pretty complex system all to itself. Um, we'll be coming through um, uh, some heavy discussions on requirements with the combatant commands over the course of the next week, which will lock that down, and then our request for proposal goes out, and then we go into that period of time where we are evaluating bids once we get those on the table. And that's really important to get it out to industry. You know, we have our government reference architectures. We know what our schedules are. We know what the requirements are. 
But at the end of the day, when industry comes back, you know, then we're going to kind of know where there might be additional trade space because it, it really is about time. And so we went through the uh, joint requirements operation or the joint the JROC uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, one of the biggest feedbacks we got from from all the warfighters was this is a time sensitive issue, and so we have to take something as complex as hit to kill. Uh, with that sort of complexity and deliver that as early as we can and a lot of that will come from industry right so so we'll, we'll get some insight as we uh, uh, get the bids on the table here over the course of the next couple months um, the uh, leveraging the current system that we have today I'll talk more about that in just a bit to, to counter that increased uh, threat set and then I'll talk more about advanced technology as we go so next chart Okay, so this is the, the placemat uh, that we've had for a while. You've seen different versions of it. You've seen us, uh, you know, updated over time. Uh, when I came in as the director uh, last summer, I said, yeah, I, I kind of want to do a big change to it. Uh, I really want to put in the hypersonic threat to show how that challenges our system. And it's just a cartoon, right? Uh, but, but to give you that sense that the hypersonics can look like ballistic missiles initially. And then they come on down and, and go into that glide phase. And then they kind of look a lot like what we've been dealing with, the, well, I'll just say the carrier killer as we're working a strike group defense for the aircraft carriers and for the Navy. You know, at that point, they all kind of look the same. They're coming in fast and they're maneuvering and they're low. And so we have the ability to take what we've been doing and modify it to deal with that, uh, that set of threats. And cruise missiles will look a lot, at, a lot they'll look very similar when you get in that end game as well. So, so we, when I start down in the lower end here with that Patriot, which kind of crosses that uh, air defense, cruise missile, and ballistic uh, defense, there's, there's capability there, right, that, that we're very proud of that we deploy today. And it's an important uh, piece, and it's a great partnership uh, you know, with the Army. Why is that important uh, to the Missile Defense Agency? Because the work that we're doing today with that to build that interoperability, and, and it's different than what we normally think of when we say interoperability. Typically, when you say interoperability, most people are thinking about exchanging data and situational awareness. When you now take two systems, THAAD purpose-built for one part of the battle space, Patriot purpose-built for another, and now you're actually uh, extending out the launchers uh, for THAAD to give flexibility. Uh, when you take a Patriot and launch it to its full kinematic capability, because you now have a THAAD radar that's, that's feeding data, doing launch on remote, engage on remote operations with that, that's a different level of integration. And then let's just take the Patriot missiles and put them inside uh, the THAAD launcher so that you have that capability within the THAAD battery. You know, that's, that's a different way of thinking of integration. Kind of takes me back to, uh, you know, Aegis ships, right? So when you look at the uh, vertical launching system, there's an array of missiles in there, and the system goes through its uh, missile selection logic, and it picks the right weapon for the right time. And so that flexibility coming to the Army is really important, particularly for a maneuver force that's going to move in quickly and do its job and then get out of there. All right, so we're demonstrating that through dynamic force employment. And, you know, that's another great uh, national defense strategy effort uh, for the Army. And we've shown where, gosh, we've got to do uh, maintenance on an Aegis Ashore site. We're worried about coverage. Let's bring in THAAD, right? So Army comes in, gets THAAD batteries uh, up and running. We, we take care of the maintenance, a long extended period to upgrade an Aegis Ashore site. And then the Army says, hey, got you covered. We're out of there. Back to the Navy. So kind of a cool thing, and that's exactly the kind of flexibility that we want to have uh, globally because the threats are, are definitely global. And as you kind of walk up uh, from there, you know, SM-6 is uh, really a very capable uh, asset on, on board Navy ships, and it's important because it's got this thing called sea-based terminal capability in it. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for a great transfer story to the Navy where Navy builds a missile and MDA comes in working with the Navy to build a capability into the front end of that missile to give it a terminal capability against ballistic missiles that are threatening the aircraft carrier, that's pretty amazing. And so we're doing that with the Navy. We're continuing to increase that capability. We'll be doing another test uh, later this year uh, off uh, a Navy new construction ship. Pretty cool. Uh, latest line right off the, the production line for SM-6 uh, to test that out against some pretty stressing threats. Um, and then, you know, I talked about that already, and it's a relationship uh, to the total force. Where we're going to be eventually is everything you see on this picture here will be integrated below that level of indications and warning. It's going to be more of an interplay and allow us to kind of achieve what I know General Carbler is all about, which is any sensor, any weapon. 
It's all about the kill chain, right? So uh, you can say any sensor, any weapon, uh, but again, these systems are all purpose built for different parts of the battle space. So it may not be a perfect match, right? So we do have to do the hard, grungy work of saying, do we have the right set of sensors on a threat? And can you build a fire control solution? And do you have the right weapon that can actually function based on that fire control solution? So it's not as easy as, as that aspirational statement of uh, any sensor, any weapon. And then the ground-based interceptors, I talked about next-gen inter interceptor, uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the big development uh, for the agency over the course of the next uh, few years, and we'll be uh, putting out that RFP soon. Down at the bottom is an array of sensors that are globally deployed, uh, maneuverable ships, maneuverable uh, THAAD batteries, maneuverable Patriot. We've got those out there. We've got some, uh, our, our partnership with the Air Force for some of the uh, sensors that are, that are located out on islands in crazy places that uh, help to fill sensor gaps. I would tell you that uh, any service would tell you that they're sensor poor. And from a missile defense perspective, we're sensor port. You can never have enough. And so by linking those together to build fire control, that, that really is the, the wave of the future. And then uh, on the left side of this, you see space. Space is uh, something I'll talk about uh, in a little more detail as we go. But we tie all this together with command control, battle management, communications. So it's C2BMC is our version of the all-domain world. And when I show you the FTG 11 video here in just a bit, you're going to see how powerful that is when you have the ability to have hardened networks that are globally deployed, that are tying these systems together, fire control quality data coming through them so that you can leverage lots of different assets, whether it's a ship on the surface of the ocean or a land-based battery or something in the air or missiles uh, coming from someplace else. And so I'll talk about that here in just a bit. So next chart, Greg. Okay. So I want to kind of get into FTG-11. This is a, the, the reason I think it's so relevant uh, for the Army. Of course, when you go on up to uh, Fort Greeley up in Alaska, right, first thing you meet, first person you meet will be a soldier, right? And so you've got the 100th Brigade and you've got the 49th Battalion. Did I get those backwards? Oh, got, it right. got it right. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So uh, General Carver was making sure I had my notes set straight. Um, I, I was so impressed when I got up there as a new director because uh, you don't get travel when you're a deputy. But when I got up there and I met the security forces who happened to be soldiers, and then I saw that Alaska was all in by having National Guard up there, and I saw the, the, the SMDC support to those teams there, and I got to see the different watch teams on console, all I could think was, why are we taking so much heat for not transferring to the Army? when? You've got an army base, and there's soldiers everywhere, and they're paying for the housing, and they're making major investments, and they're doing training. It's like, why are we killing ourselves on this transfer discussion? Uh, so anyways, all that aside, uh, what, what a... <laughs> What a great team up there. And I tell you, you know, if you want to build confidence, you know, I recommend you fly on up to uh, Fairbanks and take the hop up to Fort Greeley because it's, it's awesome country. But you will find a Army base up there, and you will see the missile fields, which are just stunning all to themselves. Uh, but then when you go see how we actually do fire control and how those soldiers on console fight the fight and how they are on watch 24-7. So anytime you, you hear about launches, and there's been a couple of the last couple of weeks, those guys are on the consoles. Those men and women are there, and they are watching, and they're, they're going to alert, and they're coming off of alert when, when they don't see that uh, they're violating any sort of uh, weapons test plan or that they've come in in any defended area that we care about. But it's great, the fact that they come up and then come down, uh, because we've had the luxury of not having to actually launch something against a threat coming in. So what we're going to show you in this test was pretty significant. Uh, the program over the years has been you know, steadily moving towards an evolution in complexity. Right? So first of all, having soldiers on console was key. Right? And having Navy ships being operated by sailors at sea. Why do we have the Navy ships there? Well, we wanted them to track and do risk reduction against these long-range threats. So new uh, construction destroyer. Let's take the Aegis ashore, digitally uh, reposit it out there. Let's put up some unmanned air vehicles. Let's get some aircraft into the network. And all of that was feeding into this command and control battle management communications, which is the backbone of what we do. And if you were to take this scenario, which is coming out of the Reagan test site in Wake Island, and, and kind of rotate it up, it starts to look like a, a very recognizable scenario where you will have uh, space uh, telling you that I see a flash, and then we're going to fly through the, uh, the, the lens of a, a radar. We're, we're going to get the track, and then you're going to have another radar provide you discrimination. We're going to launch a, a GBI. In this case, we launched two of them because we want to characterize what it looks like when you have two in the air at the same time engaging. And what we had wanted to see in the data we were trying to get to build up our modeling capability was 
intercepting the lethal object, and then the second one flying through that debris scene and being able to discriminate and say, well, here's the next lethal object, because we are flying with countermeasures in, in this event. So pr pretty significant stuff, all of that being operated out at the uh, Missile Defense Inter Interoperability Center up in uh, Colorado Springs. And so I think I've talked about everything on the chart here. So let's go ahead and flip the chart, uh, Greg, and then let's play the video. I'll step aside and uh, we'll see what you think. On March 25th, 2019, the Missile Defense Agency, or MDA, conducted an historic test of the nation's homeland missile defenses over the Pacific Ocean. This was the first test involving the launch of two interceptors and it resulted in the intercept of a long-range ballistic missile target with countermeasures. Following their release from the missile in space, missile defense countermeasures are intended to trick the missile defense system into missing the lethal object. From the Marshall Islands in the Pacific to the coast of California, across more than 4,800 miles, MDA deployed two powerful radars, one on Wake Island and the other in the Pacific Ocean. The two interceptors were ready in silos at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, and they carried kill vehicles designed to collide with the target. Once launched from the Kwajalein Atoll, the target missile rocketed towards space, heading east in the direction of the United States. Following detection by satellites using infrared sensors, the forward-based radar on Wake Island saw the missile and tracked it as it ascended. The radar also saw the countermeasures released by the target and sent this data to the command and control, battle management, and communication system, the brains of the missile defense system. This information on the target was then passed to the fire control stations in Colorado Springs and in Fort Greeley, Alaska, which then sent the information to the sea-based X-band radar stationed in the Pacific Ocean. The SBX radar picked up the target as it flew through space and collected additional and more precise information to send back to the fire control stations in the United States. Once the data was received by the warfighters operating the system, they fired the first, or lead, interceptor. Less than a minute later, they launched the second, or trail, interceptor. Accelerating into space, the interceptors burned through their first two stages, and the third stage of each interceptor propelled the kill vehicles towards the target. After receiving additional data from the radars, the two kill vehicles used their sensors to find the objects within the target cluster. They then maneuvered with the lead kill vehicle zeroing in on and colliding with the primary target, obliterating it. The trailing kill vehicle was able to see through the intercept flash and debris to hit what the system determined to be the second most lethal object, also destroying it through the force of impact. This historic test provided the warfighter with increased confidence in the operation of America's homeland missile defenses, which stand ready around the clock to protect the country from long-range missile attack. Okay. Hua, all right. So I have an Army Air Defender uh, XO who lets me say Hua once a day, so I think <laughs> I... I uh, went through my maximum allowable limitation. All right, uh, hey, so, so great, great event. Uh, now, now let me talk to you about what we're gonna be doing uh, a little bit later uh, this year. So I mentioned the fact that the mighty USS John Finn, a new construction destroyer, and the reason I keep uh, harping on that is when we were testing off of USS John Paul Jones, you know, DDG-53, one of the oldest destroyers that was modernized with ballistic missile uh, and integrated air and missile defense capability, now being done in stride, ballistic missile defense being built into new construction ships. Another great transition and transfer story, right? Navy is now paying for that capability to be deployed, and these are ships that are operated by sailors and officers. So, incredible. So you got uh, uh, John Finn out there doing some practice during FTG-11. Now she's gonna be out on station when we launch an ICBM in a defense of Hawaii scenario. So what you see here, uh, is something that'll look familiar to you. We're gonna launch an ICBM out of some place in the middle of the Pacific. We're gonna have a radar that's gonna pick up a track and then we're gonna fly this thing all the way in and the ship's gonna engage it with an SM-3 Block 2A. So that's a missile that we cooperatively developed with Japan. And I'm gonna tell you right now, and I'll show you another chart, it does not replace the ground-based interceptors, right? It, does, it wasn't built to go do that, but it's got some capability to give you a layered defense. So if you have a leaker from the GMD system, and if you had a ship parked off the coast with an SM-3 Block 2A in its arsenal, then you have the ability to maybe uh, you know, take that out and add that additional layer. And we have that same sort of thought with that. 
right? So, so it's important, and the reason I want to kind of piece this together for you, you know, from an Army perspective and an Army air defense perspective, I think that's a pretty powerful, uh, you know, combination of things that, that you could have. All right, so let's, let's flip to the next chart. So that, that's coming up uh, here soon. This is, uh, I'm asked about this all the time, you know, what, what is layered homeland defense? What, what does that look like? And this is a, uh, you know, kind of a conceptual view. Uh, and we were being a little defensive when we built the chart at first because we wanted to make sure nobody walked away saying, oh my God, SM3 can replace the GBIs. Oh my gosh, that can do that, right? If you just look at the engagement volume of GBI, right? I read an article from yesterday where they talked about the fact that, hey, the reason it's gotta be this big and why it's gotta do that is because it's defending all 50 states. And that is a fact, right? So when you take a, 50-inch diameter missile, and you compare that to a 21-inch uh, diameter missile, you know, the physics are what they are. And so the SM3, though, gives you a capability. It's got some broad coverage, right? Built really to defend the fleet against ballistic missile attacks because guess what? Ballistic missiles will target ships uh, in addition to targeting uh, land sites. And so our intent was to populate uh, Indo-PACOM uh, with those missiles back when we were developing that system in uh, cooperation with Japan will likely take those missiles, and we're having discussions now as to what the priority ought to be for them. Should they go to Aegis ashore in Europe? Should they go to ships in Indo-PACOM? Should they go someplace else? And so we're working our way through that, but the question is, can you really integrate this now as a system? So I mentioned the Thad and Patriot story. It's gonna be the same story between GMD and SM3 Aegis. You've gotta integrate them, right? So that, and what I mean by that is, who's gonna take what shot and when? Right, so that's an important part. Um, we used to call that engagement coordination when we were maneuvering between different uh, missile types. So we're gonna wanna do something like that. And I would tell you that's sort of in the uh, concept phase as we build out that architecture. So what this allows you to do, if you've got this ability to do a shoot, assess, shoot, a two shot uh, GBI kind of engagement, and then pick up pieces or go after something that leaked through with an SM3. And if you get down to that, that point defense area with that, if you have that kind of capability, again, that's flexibility because these are maneuver forces, right? So this allows us uh, to have a lot more flexibility. And so we're, we're pretty excited to, to pursue this. And uh, uh, the department has uh, funded us uh, in the PB21 budget to, to, to pursue uh, changes to the THAAD uh, weapon system, changes to the Aegis weapon system to build out that layered homeland defense capability. So while we're going through the next generation interceptor and continuing to, uh, make sure that we're reliable within the existing GBI fleet, this is an option that, that's on the table for our combatant commands and our services uh, to think about. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about space, um, and I, I won't spend a lot of time here. I kind of described it to you, but I would tell you that there's a heavy dependence on it. It, it almost doesn't matter you know, what fight you're fighting, right? Whether you're defending a carrier battle group with a cruiser or a destroyer, or if you've got a THAAD battery that's now protecting an area that Aegis Ashore was at, or if you're forward deploying THAAD uh, to another area to defend again, against a very specific set of threats, that, that, uh, that dependency or that reliance on space is important. And it's as simple as this. It is expanding the battle space. It goes right back to my sensor story earlier about the, the earlier you see it, the earlier you can kill it. And the earlier you kill it, the better off you're gonna be. Right, it's it's just kind of that simple. It's a, it's a detect, control, engage story, uh, and, and I've been, I've had that beaten in my head since I was a young ensign. So uh, you know, indications and warning starts there. Getting to track is important. Getting to fire control quality data, discriminating, which means you're picking out the most lethal object. Because there's a lot of junk that goes up uh, in these. Uh, I'll just pick an ICBM as an example. There's a lot of junk up there, and radars love junk. They'll just go there and just burn all their energy up, just tracking every little object, and you've got to process all that stuff out, right? So it's pretty, uh, pretty wild. But the great thing about space is that you are looking down and you are seeing the whole picture. So the, to me, the, the, the biggest advantage is as you start to maneuver with ballistic missiles or you have hypersonics that are going up and down and they're maneuvering about, if you have cruise missiles that are coming in and then going up the coast and going for a target that you're not expecting it to be, it's a much less predictable equation anymore, right? And so prediction, the predicted impact point becomes a very important uh, piece to what you're doing and it's a lot more complex now and space really buys you a lot. So I won't say much more uh, about that, but it's, uh, it's where the department is going. I think it's the right thing to go do. Uh, next uh, chart, please. So a little bit about international cooperation because we are also from an MDA and Army partnership, we are tied together at the hip on this, right? So when you think about where we're going with that, and we have a, a Saudi Arabia case, we just finished up the, the last set of interceptors for the UAE. Uh, we're moving out now on the Saudi case. This is an opportunity, 
So when the department put money in the Missile Defense Agency budget to do modifications to the THAAD missile, we have a foreign military sales case that we can leverage to give us some lift in that. And so we're gonna, we, we've got things that we were doing for the U.S. forces within that, that case and being able to leverage that as, uh, and along with the budget that's been provided to get to a demo to allow us to move to more of a homeland defense. So I guess the story is really how we're blending regional systems. What used to be a split, when you looked at MDA budget a few years ago, there was always this homeland split and this regional split, right? They are converging because a threat is converging. That's just the way it, it goes, and so we're being responsive to that. But international cooperation is pretty doggone important. I mentioned the SM3 um, Block 2A program with Japan. Uh, Aegis Ashore has, uh, has uh, moved over to Japan. Japan is procuring uh, two of those sites, and so that, that's really good. Uh, we know about the THAAD deployment uh, to the ROC, uh, joint analysis, science technology, that whole spectrum of outreach and eventually getting to operations uh, with our partners and allies is really what it's all about. It's, it's a full spectrum of that. It's not just about FMS and selling systems. It is about operating together because that, that is how you take on some of the threats that we have today is those partnerships, and it allows us to, to have uh, many, many more assets that are capable and tied in and interoperable with what we're doing. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'll wrap it up uh, here. Uh, this is... Um, Something I've, I've talked about a little bit, uh, almost, I didn't mean for it to be a theme for today, uh, but I want to just kind of give you some sense. I gave you that example of Fort Greeley, so now I'll give you another one, right? So if you fly into Romania, drive up to the Navy base, you meet a Romanian security force officer, then you meet a sailor. Then you go on into the Aegis Ashore site there in Romania, and you have sailors doing maintenance on the equipment and you have sailor watch teams with a responsible commanding officer who's going to do weapons release. That's what you've got. So MDA in partnership with the Navy, Navy transferred, take, took that over, and they're operating it today. Right? I have to remind people at times that, no, there are not MDA people on ships. No, the Navy's got them. They're running with it. Just like you don't have MDA people operating the THAAD battery. That, those are soldiers. That's what they do. And so this is just a chart to kind of drive that home. But there's a clear lane in which MDA has to provide support right, for those BMD unique specific things. Right? So on the Aegis ship, the ballistic missile signal processor within that radar, you know, we're going to go help the Navy with that if there's a fault in that, if that comes down. If we've got an issue with that, if it's not common support equipment, we're going to come in and work with the Army to go fix that. And so it's a really important partnership, and so I don't want to, don't want to ever put that at risk. And so we're in a good place here. i just give you some examples on this chart. And uh, Craig, if you sw switch the last one. Ah, there it is. Um, I will now take questions if you got them. Thanks, General. Sir, so while the uh, audience thinks about a few questions, I'll kick things off. Okay. Can you better define how transition and transfer of THAAD from MDA to Army has worked out and what responsibilities Army has versus MDA and when it comes to the equipment and upgrades? Is it being done the same way with the other services as well? Yeah, so it, it depends on where you draw the line. And what, what I've tried to do over the course of the last year is to work with the services so that we have a very clear definition of what we mean by transition and transfer. Right? So all too often when you say transfer to somebody, depending on what their agenda is, it's production of missiles, it's buying more batteries, it's the development, it's the whole program. If you're looking for a consistent, I'm glad you asked it that way, if you're looking for a consistent definition, you ought to divide the line on what services do well, which is to operate and sustain those systems. So if you have a developing agency like the Missile Defense Agency, or if you have the, the Army Missiles in Space developing something, right, they'll work their way through all the way through development, they'll do, go, do, go do a procurement and get it out in the field, and then now Army is operating and sustaining. Same thing with ships, right? Navy's doing the development and paying for that, MDA will bring in the ballistic missile capability, go to production, buy a ship, boom, Navy's operating and sustaining. So the question is, are we doing everything we should do as a missile defense agency, agency to ensure that the services can operate and sustain? And I want to change the conversation to that conversation because I think that's important. It's all about war fighting, right? And so we've got to make sure that we're giving the support that's required as opposed to moving the line on what transfer means. So, Admiral Dave McFarland, BAA Hi, Dave. Systems. Uh, you talked a little bit about NGI and where you are with NGI and going forward with the uh, contract. Can you share your thoughts on, uh, you just talked sustainment, on DO, DOSP next and where you're going with that? Yeah, 
Okay, so for those who aren't familiar with DS, D, O, S, well, let me just say we have a contract today with, with the Big Prime, right? And uh, we, we know that that contract is not uh, giving us everything that we need for the future. So we are going to compete that contract uh, downstream. We're going to come through NGI and then we're going to make sure that ground systems and sensors and fire control, all of the, the rest of the system, uh, that we have an opportunity to inject a competition because I think that's very important. Uh, so when we did something called DOSP uh, a couple years ago, uh, the focus was on how do you take a big massive contract like that where you've got a lead system integrator. And I, I would tell you our lead system integrator does a, does a great job today and the partnerships uh, with industry within that construct do a great job. But we think that it's, it's, it's so large and complex that we'd, we'd be doing everybody a favor by being able to kind of split that up without losing the, the integration amongst all those pieces. And so our intent is to move down that direction, Dave. Okay. Hi, Jen Judson with Hi, Defense Jen. News. How are you? Thank you very <laughs> Long well. time Thank no you. see. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wanted to ask about the THAAD requirement because it's for the longest time the requirement sure. has been for nine batteries, but it was only funding for seven. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about how Patriot Thad are you know already stretched thin here, uh, and if you're talking about making Thad the underlayer for for the, um, all of your homeland defense, um, yeah. do you envision a near-term push for finally funding those eighth and ninth batteries and maybe beyond? Yeah, so, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, for as long as I've been with MDA, there's been a question about how many batteries are required who's gonna pay for them, how we're gonna do it. And to be honest with you, that's the whole reason why everyone got into this transfer discussion, because it was, hey, let's, let's go force the Army to pay for it, or let's go have MDA pay for it, right? So it was a great way to make nobody accountable at all, right? So at the end of the day, what you needed to do was go run the analysis, right? So what theater are we talking about, right? And let's go understand what that battery requirement is. And the Army did that as part of the missile defense review. And so there's a number that comes from that. And then Army now is currently looking at and with the joint staff looking at what that would look like in a different theater and what is that requirement and then what does that total requirement look at i would say that uh, from a homeland defense capability since we're you know we're just now moving towards the demo to see if we can actually do something with that we don't have a requirement of that yet but we'll have to look into that uh, but the nice thing is again the, these are you know maneuverable batteries run by soldiers and you know we'll, we'll take them where they need to go Right, and, and you've seen evidence of that over the last couple of years as the Army demonstrates their ability to move quickly to places that we weren't thinking about putting that. So I know it's not the perfect answer for today, but when you get into requirements, um, it, it becomes important, right? We need to sit down and go do that and stop having this uh, silly discussion on you know, who's gonna pay for it. If we need them, if we're gonna have more, the department will figure out how to go pay for it. And I don't know how, that will, how that'll play out yet. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Dan Wasserby with Jane's. Um, you mentioned the, for NGI, the, the warfighters that come back to you and said it's a very time sensitive issue. Yeah. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Is that because the legacy system is reaching end of life cycles or is that their view of the threat and its numbers or increasing capability? Yeah, it's kind of, kind of a, a mix of, of all of that. You, you kind of answered the, uh, the question uh, with, with your question. But um, so, you, so you have an existing fleet today. Uh, if you look at the results of FTG 11, um, I won't put uh, words into Northcom's mouth, but they'll tell you, hey, <laughs> we're pretty confident the system's going to do well. One thing I didn't point out is we shot one of the newest ones and one of the oldest ones uh, in that test, right? And, and they performed flawlessly, right? So, so in terms of today's threat, I think we're in a good place, and we're going to be in a good place for a long time. What we need to do is to take a hard look at that inventory that's in the ground today and go beyond just analysis when you determine what the reliability fall off is, right? That's kind of what you're, what you're talking about. Every system's got that, right? Any ship that's you know, on the planet today has a reliability fall off. It'll trail off. Any weapon system will, will do that. But you want to have one that's uh, hardware in the loop based uh, to where you're actually working on those systems. And today, uh, because we're hardware poor, uh, we, we typically uh, do it through analysis. And so um, we have a general thought on when that fall off is, and we know what the NGI schedule looks like, and the, the, the real driver behind the warfighter is let, let's pull it in, uh, let's pull it in so that we don't have a gap there. So, and the other reason for the gap is that we, we were moving out on the prior program RKB to get 20 in the ground by a specific date, right? So that's now moved to the right. So it's a tough spot to be in, but we're working our way through. We've got the best minds on this one, and uh, we'll, we'll come through. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, sir. Captain Tony Khan. Hey, Captain. Um, we talked a lot about kinetic intercept. Um, is there any initiatives going forward to incorporate uh, directed energy defense systems, such as previously explored the airborne laser, uh, those types of systems across the service branches into our architecture? Yeah, hey, great, great, great question. Um, you may have caught the subtlety in my placemat chart where it says today's active missile defense. So I'm just not going to answer your question. <laughs> To be honest with you, uh, the department is uh, working through different options, and when those technologies are ready, we're going to bring them in. We are working other things that I just won't talk about. Thanks. Sir, if it's okay, we uh, have a question from the live stream. Oh. And I forgot as about you, the live stream. That's cool. All right. As you know, the FY21 president's budget transfers funding from NDA to SDA for the space tracking layer. Mm -hmm. Does this mean the HBTSS program will be executed by SDA? Um, what, what it means is that uh, the department is consolidating uh, those space efforts uh, under the Space Development Agency. Uh, Dr. Griffin, if you were here, would tell you that MDA is executing today. We're going to execute through 20 because we're essentially building the sensors, but we need to be a part of that larger national defense architecture. And uh, when we go into 21, it's, it's a matter of SDA owning the architecture, and MDA will still be responsible for providing the sensors. Yes, sir. Well, a uh, quick question. Um, thanks for recognizing the great soldiers of the 100th Brigade and the 49th Battalion. In, in relation to that, uh, the question came up last week in the hearing with Secretary Esper and General Milley about an East Coast-based uh, GBI site. Right. Where are we on the analysis or the need for that? Oh, th thanks. I, I will tell you that the analysis needs to be updated. Um, last year, we, we were asked uh, by the Hill to come in and provide the results of the uh, uh, environmental impact survey that, that kind of basically looked at three sites. And they said, well, we, we want to know what your preferred site is. So, so based on the analysis that we had at the time, based on assumptions that were made at the time, uh, we, we had a, a site that, that we reported out on. Um, I would say um, when the nation's ready to invest in something like that, as threats from that uh, area uh, start to increase, you know, we'll, we'll want to go back in and take another look. Yeah. But we, we do have a preferred site based on the assumptions that were made at the time. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, thank you for being here. Please give Vice Admiral hey, thanks, Hill everybody. a big Appreciate round of applause. It.